Hartwood, your host for this webinar. Eat Safe is a USAID-sponsored five-year research and learning program that addresses the intersection of consumers and vendors in markets and their ability to shape the safety of their food. Eat Safe is delighted to be launching this second event in a series of food safety and nutrition webinars. This one on food safety in traditional markets in Africa and Asia, where nutritious foods are often sourced. In this second webinar, we begin by recognizing that in low and middle income countries, many consumers buy their nutrient rich foods, such as meat, fish, milk, vegetables, uh, fruits, um, in, in, in these traditional, sometimes wet, sometimes informal markets. And many of you know these markets, and many of us actually are drawn to them. You'll probably find me in one of them at five o'clock in the morning as the vendors are coming in. They're hubs of life. They are a buzz with community, with conversation, and with insects. They are crowded and loud, and they are slippery and just simply remarkable. They also play a vital role in food availability and affordability for the nutritionally vulnerable, but they have limited infrastructure um, to control the safety of food and usually no oversight uh, from public health authorities. So there are really few tools available to help vendors and consumers in food, ensure their food remains safe. So today we discuss how food safety plays out in these traditional markets. What are the main issues and obstacles hindering improvement in food safety? And what has proven successful? What drives consumer and vendors choices? And whether that consumer and vendor um, interaction can actually foster safe food stewardship. At GAIN, our goal is to improve the consumption of safe, nutritious foods for all people, especially the most vulnerable to nutrition. We believe if food is unsafe, it cannot be nutritious. And we take this very seriously with our programming and research. If we care about nutrition, we have to care about the safety of the food we advocate for, and particularly in the environments where the nutritionally vulnerable are sourcing most of their foods, these traditional and often informal markets. You're about to meet a panel of distinguished food safety specialists. Our moderator, Dr. Elisabetta Lambertini, is a senior scientist in food safety at GAIN and a research lead for Eat Safe. She is a qualitative, she's a quantitative researcher in food safety and public health who specializes in One Health risk analysis and risk-based intervention design. Elisabetta will guide us through this second opportunity to explore the linkages between food safety and nutrition. I'm looking forward to the session and the ones that will follow. Until next time, please stay safe and eat safe. Elisabetta, over to you. Thank you, Bonnie, Thank you, Bonnie. and welcome everyone. Today we have a very rich webinar for you. We start with a keynote followed by remarks by three panelists and audience Q&A. Throughout the webinar, we invite you to send questions through the Q&A box, which is different from the chat, and engage in the discussion in the chat at any time. Without further ado, I'll introduce you to our keynote speaker, Dr. Delia Grace Randall, who is an epidemiologist and veterinarian with more than 20 years of experience working in food safety in developing countries. She's a professor at the Natural Resources Institute at the University of Greenwich, UK, and a collaborating scientist at ILRI, the International Livestock Research Institute, where uh, for 15 years she's been leading research on agricultural associated diseases. Her research focus, um, research program focuses on risk-based approaches to food safety in livestock system, especially in Sub-Saharan Africa and South Asia, as well as one health approaches to control zoonotic diseases and antimicrobial resistance. Uh, Delia, thank you so much for joining us today and over to you. With you to discuss um, uh, food safety in low and middle income countries, an uh, area dear to my heart and where I've been researching for the last 20 years. Um, uh, Let's see, are the slides starting to load? Uh, maybe we can move on to the first slide. Uh, that's the last slide. Thank you. Um, so next slide, please. 
So as I said, we've been uh, working in, in, in food safety for many years, and these are some of the products. Uh, they include uh, evidence pieces for donors, the first book, and so far the only book on food safety in informal markets, and lots of publications in peer-reviewed journals. Next slide. And some of these have been quite influential. For example, a white paper we were commissioned to do for USAID helped set up the funding of the Food Safety Innovation Lab, and I think has led to renewed interest in funding food safety. Um, click, please. As well as that, we are very interested in the interactions between food safety, nutrition, equity, and other issues. Next slide. So this short presentation is in three parts. First of all, I'm going to talk about the impact of foodborne disease in developing countries. Next, about foodborne diseases, a little bit of a deep dive into the sources, the foods implicated, and the trends. And the last section, and probably the most important, is going to be about how we manage foodborne disease. Next. So foodborne, why does foodborne disease, why is it a development issue? When I started to work in development uh, 25 years ago, I, I think people were, I'm a vet by training, and people were very interested in animal diseases and zoonosis, but nobody was really talking about foodborne disease. But now it's pretty high on the development agenda. So why is that? Well, for one thing, developing country consumers show high concern over foodborne disease. In some countries, it's often their single highest concern. We found that in Vietnam. And then the huge burden of foodborne diseases mainly falls on the shoulders of developing countries. It has high costs and it limits access of poor farmers to high value markets. Moreover, food discriminates. What, in food safety, what we call the yompi, that is the young, the old, the malnourished, the pregnant and the immunosuppressed are most at risk. Risk is not, is not equal. Next. Of course, the first and the most important thing is the actual health burden of foodborne disease. And for long, this was not known. But in the past uh, five years, work by the World Health Organization has developed the first ever estimate of the global burden of foodborne disease. And in fact, this burden is equivalent to that of malaria, HIV AIDS, or TB, what we call the big three. This graph shows what are the main causes of years being lost from foodborne disease? You can see the most important is germs, followed by heavy metals, followed almost equally by worms, and with toxins, perhaps surprising to many of you, the least important. Next. Next, please. And it's not just the, sorry, you're going backwards. Can we go forwards? Um, and it's not just the health burden, it's also the economic burden. This is a study um, uh, with Jaffe, uh, Steve Jaffe from the World Bank as the lead author. I was one of the co-authors. And it developed the first ever cost of foodborne disease in, in low and middle income countries. And what we found was that the cost in terms of productivity loss, uh, the human capital loss, was equivalent to $95 billion a year. The cost in terms of treatment, illness treatment, was 15 billion, whereas the trade loss was around five to seven. And yet another study we did with the Global Food Safety Partnership showed that nearly all the investments by donors in the past 20 years had focused on trade, which as you can see, was the least cause of loss. Next, please. And it's not just health and it's not just money. There are more things to life, life than money. It's also livelihoods. Most of the foods, foods in, in poor countries, especially the fresh foods, the risky foods, are sold in, in these traditional markets Bonnie told about. And these traditional markets employ enormous numbers of men and women. And women often have a very important role. This was a study we did in 20 informal value chains, and we just went along the chain and you can see where men dominate, where women dominate and where both dominate. And what we find, for example, in poultry, where women dominate, is when it goes from informal to formal, often the women drop out of this sector. Next. 
And food safety and nutrition, of course, again, uh, I think has got, has got more um, fame for nutrition work than from food safety, though hopefully that will change. Um, but there are strong links between food and safety and nutrition, complex links. Certainly diarrhea is a risk factor for stunting. Um, there's also subclinical diarrhea is associ may be associated with environmental enteric dysfunction. There are opaque associations between aflatoxins and stunting. Um, importantly, trying to get our food safer may make it less available and accessible to the poor. And food scares around food safety decrease consumption of nutritious foods. We've seen that now with COVID-19 in India, where there's been a huge drop in consumption of chicken, although chicken, highly, chicken and eggs, highly nutritious and in no way involved in transmission of COVID. Next. Food safety and market access was a big area of research about five or 10 years ago. I think people are realizing now that it's less important than was thought. Certainly food safety standards can exclude small farms and the farmers supplying the formal sector tend to be richer and male. Um, and when markets differentiate, substandard food tends to be targeted towards the poor. But on the other hand, these differentiated markets are still a very small share uh, in, in most low and middle income countries. Um, and with support, smallholders can participate in demanding markets. Next. So that takes me to my, the next part of my presentation, the deep dive into foodborne disease. Next. The first thing is, um, we, there's a saying in food safety, what you worry about and what makes you sick and kills you are not the same. And in most of the surveys we do with policymakers and lay people, they're very worried about chemicals and they're not very worried about biological hazards. Um, and this is just a study, I won't go into the details, but we, we, we explained in, in Vietnam that first graph I showed you where it was the, the germs and the worms which were causing most of the problems. Um, and our stakeholders did not believe us. So we did an in-depth quantitative risk assessment for both chemicals and microbial hazards. And we showed the risk from, from chemicals was negligible and the risk from micro, microbiological hazards was very high. Next. But if lay people and politicians are wrong, experts are also often wrong. This is a study from Ethiopia where we compare the experts in green with the actual burden studies in blue. You can see a couple of things. The burden studies follow what we call the Pareto ratio, the law of the vital few and the trivial many. And we see this in many health conditions where a few conditions are responsible for most of the burden. The experts think everything is important, especially the thing they work on. The experts also tend to think that, that feared dread diseases like anthrax, which are actually in terms of burden very small, but in terms of fear are very high, are much more important than they actually are. Next, please. Next. So if uh, the lay people are wrong and the experts are wrong, how do we find out what is actually causing the, the problems with foodborne disease? And for that, we need risk analysis, risk assessment, and epidemiology. As I said, the, food book, the first global study by the FARC has given us a good idea of the hazards involved. Um, uh, sorry, I seem to have lost the this, 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 this screen sharing. Um, but other studies, which are, are less, de less detailed um, by Ilri and others, have found that uh, the foods most responsible or animal source foods and produce here in green and blue. Um, and yet again, when we look at the investments as we did with the, this GFSP report, most of the investments have been in, in staple products such as maize and peanuts from which the risk is actually very low. Next. Next, please. And the other thing about foodborne disease is that while most, fortunately, most infectious diseases are showing an epidemiological transition, that is they are declining. There on, you, on, you can see from 2000 to 2016, HIV declined by 44%, which is excellent news. 
but foodborne disease is going in the other directions. Even in rich countries, this is from the CDC, between 2006 and 2015, there was no improvement in foodborne disease. And the report I mentioned by Jaffe et al showed that foodborne disease is actually increasing in low and middle income countries. Next. Next. So what can we do about it? The knee-jerk reaction tends to be regulate. We need more regulations and we need to implement regulations. And this is though everybody knows that it is extremely difficult to, reg to implement regulations in poor governance situations. This slide just so shows a number of surveys which Ilri carried out in a number of countries. And you can see that generally speaking, there was very low compliance with standards. The standards were there. It wasn't a problem of lack of standards or lack, or lack of regulation. It was lack of compliance. I sometimes say that when 5% of milk fails to meet standards, you have a problem with your milk. But when 95% of milk fails to meet standards, you have a problem with your standards. So regulations won't get us there. Next. Another common belief is that we can modernize our way to food safety. That, you know, if we get to selling food from supermarkets and get rid of these traditional, these, these, these buzzing, busy, wet markets, um, then our food will be safe. Certainly food in, in high income countries, which is mainly sold from supermarkets, is pretty safe. But in low and middle income countries, we find, first of all, supermarketization is much slower than thought. And secondly, and this surprises many, the formal sector food is much riskier than thought often more risky than the informal sector food. And thirdly, modern business models have often run into problems. Next slide. So this is a study from Vietnam. Uh, I don't know if you noticed the pictures at the, the previous slide. One was a modern supermarket, the other a traditional wet market. But when one looked very nice and clean and had a cold chain, one looked, you know, a little messy. Um, but when we looked at the bacteria, the higher it is, the worse it is. The blue, the blue purple supermarkets were the worst and the wet markets were actually better than the supermarkets across a wide range of bacteria. Next. And also there's this problem of trying to jump from, you know, overnight from traditional to modern, which can make things worse. This was a modern abattoir installed in Nigeria 20 years ago. It looked very nice. But it's always easier to get investments for infrastructure than to get investments to maintain that infrastructure. And if you don't maintain infrastructure, this is what you get. Some of you may not be food safety experts, but I think all of you can see that this is not an ideal way to prepare meat. Next. Good practices, good agricultural practices, good manufacturing practices. That has been a mantra for many, partly because it's been very successful in getting food from developing countries into export markets and earning money for, money for them. And these developing countries have been able to comply quite well when they get a good premium for doing good, good practices and when they have third party labs who find out when they're not doing good practices and penalize them. So what we found is that while export gap has been pretty good, domestic gap has had a much more limited effect in four years of massive promotion, Vietnam GAP reached only 0.06% of farmers. And in Thailand, GAP farmers had no better practices than non-GAP. So what we no behavior change without change in incentives or change in choice architecture. Next. Well, if things, those things don't work, um, what does work? We did a systematic literature review of interventions in food safety. And this is what we found. These, and when I say these work, it means that they make food safer, at least during the time the project studied us. It doesn't necessarily mean that it will, that, is, that it is a solution that is sustainable or scalable. But these are things which are, we considered promising. Changes in processes, such as risk-based approaches, pro approaches and HACCP. New and appropriate technologies, milk cans, boilers, disinfectants novel technologies like, like Aflosay for biological control, changes in the way people manage things like, like tra uh, training for street traders, 
Controlling zoonosis, 65% of foodborne diseases are zoonotic. So if we control these in the reservoir hosts, rather than letting them get into the food, it's more cost effective. Policies for an, an enabling environment. And what we're currently very interested in is market-based solutions. Can the customer make the food safer? Next. We have some limited examples of success. One thing Ilri has been working on for the last 15 years has been improving milk safety. And some of these projects now last. Uh, go back, please. Back, please. Um, and some of these projects now have been finished for 10 years. And when we go back to evaluate, um, I mean, they basically considered, uh, consisted of branding, training, certification. Uh, we, these are two projects, one in India, one in Kenya. Economic analysis showed they benefited the national economy by $33 million a year in Kenya, $6 million in Assam. Uh, many of the traders are still registered and more than 7 million consumers are still benefiting from, from safer milk. So that's impacted scale and that's sustainable. Next. Similarly in Uganda, we worked with pork butchers. Um, on, at the top, you can see the abattoir before we arrived. This is the only pork abattoir for the whole of Kampala. All of that waste was lying on the floor or being thrown into the stream. Eventually it made its way into the stream next door. We found out that waste was valuable. We helped them install biogas and this enabled them to make savings on firewood incentives. Once you can see you're making money, it gives you an incentive to change your behavior. Next. And again, further work in, in Uganda showing that fairly cheap and simple ways of communicating with, with people. This was translating uh, information into local languages about a worm, using pictures which people could understand and how to prevent it. Uh, simple technology, something called the, the, a tippy tap, where you can wash your hands without ever having to touch the, touch the, uh, the, the container. Um, and rather simple packages, which low cost packages, which can make, um, which can make a difference. $15 per kit was improved the food safety considerably. Next. So our final conclusion is that there are three essentials if we want to make food safer in uh, informal markets. You need an enabling environment. The policies, the implementation, the regulation must not be hostile to the informal market. You need a pull, you need incentives. And we think consumers can be important, but there can be other incentives. So there must be some motivation for behavior change. And then you need a push. You need value chain actors who have the training and the technology to be able to respond to those incentives. Last slide, please. So the take home messages, foodborne disease is very important, both for human health, for economics and development. And there is a huge health burden equivalent to malaria, HIV, AIDS, or TB. And most of this is due to microbes and worms in fresh foods sold in wet or informal markets. Yet, while hazards in informal markets are usually high, risks are sometimes low, and perception is a poor guide to risk. And the informal, the formal sector, can be as worse or as bad as the informal. Foodborne disease is probably increasing in developing countries, and this is a very important point. Currently, there are no proven approaches which work in mass markets in low and middle income countries and which are both sustainable and scalable. We have approaches which work in niche markets. We have approaches which work in high income countries and we have approaches which are not sustainable and not scalable. Pilots never fail and pilots never scale. Um, so with that, I finish my presentation and turn back to the moderator. Thank you, Delia. It's my pleasure now to introduce you to our three panelists, um, starting with Dr. Salome Bukachi, who is a medical anthropologist and associate professor at the University of Nairobi in Kenya. She has 20 years of experience working on community knowledge and practices in relation to livestock and zoonotic diseases, including gender issues, nutrition anthropology, and socioeconomic and cultural factors that link infectious disease and development. Mr. Tanvir Sifat, 
brings us a private sector perspective as the Director of Strategy and Business Development at Direct Fresh, based in Bangladesh. A growth strategy with 10 years of experience across multiple sectors, uh, he's now leading the rapid growth of Direct Fresh Limited, a 360 food solution provider in Bangladesh. Direct Fresh is a seven-year-old company that imports, trades, and produces food products using its own processing and distribution channels and delivers directly to retail and institutional customers. Last but not least, Dr. Vivian Hoffman is an agricultural economist and senior research fellow at IFPRI, the International Food Policy Research Institute, and join us from Nairobi, Kenya. She has researched health behavior and technology adoption at household and farm level, with an emphasis on food safety and post-harvest practices. As an example, she has worked with small-scale retailers in Kenya to assess consumer demand for aflatoxin-safe food. And Vivian will speak about how consumer demand affects incentives for food business operators to provide safe food and how our regulators could play a role in strengthening these incentives. Dr. Bocacci, over to you. Thank you very much um, for um, this uh, uh, opportunity to be able to share aspects on uh, food safety. I'll be sharing more from a social uh, perspective, looking at the anthropological issues that uh, are, are important for us to consider when dealing with food safety. Um, so uh, we find that uh, safe food is important for both health and nutrition. And uh, attaining food safety is important and a key thing in many countries. Uh, a lot of attention has been paid to the informal markets, especially looking at the food safety aspects in the informal uh, markets. But sometimes we don't quite focus a lot in the role that they play in supporting livelihoods and nutrition. Because some time, uh, the key aspect that they play in supporting livelihoods and nutrition becomes a driver in why consumers keep going to these informal markets. Um, so much as in most traditional markets in Kenya and in Africa as a whole, we find that the traditional markets are open air markets and uh, don't quite have a formal uh, value chain structure in which one can really follow the food from uh, production to the time it reaches the consumer. However, these informal uh, markets have their own informal regulations that inform the aspects of production, distribution, and even including the markets for the food products. What we find is that they leverage a lot on the interpersonal relationships of consumers and sellers, and they use this to build their base for food safety and accountability. So when we look at the urban and the rural area, we'll see a bit of differences, but still similarities in terms of those interpersonal uh, relationships. For example, in the rural areas, consumers and vendors are normally connected by their uh, neighborly, neighbor, neighborliness and uh, sometimes the interpersonal relationship, the geographical area, as well as sometimes the social kinship uh, linkages that uh, connect them together. And uh, we find that this sometimes serves as a quality control where communities are able to buy products from amongst themselves. And to an extent, qualities are ascertained by the goodwill of both the producers as members of the same uh, community. Um, the interpersonal interactions of the consumers and vendors in the urban areas also borrow from this kind of informal um, relationships where consumers tend to... Uh, repeatedly buy from a vendor who, or a retailer whom they have a relationship with and uh, who they can trust, given a relationship that they foster over time. So many times we see even when one goes to the market, there's a particular vendor that you prefer to go to based on uh, over time you've learned to know each other based on you buying severally from them. And uh, this sometimes helps develop trust over time. So one often finds that a consumer may prefer to buy, for example, milk uh, from a vendor or from a, a butcher whom they know, hence the trust, the person based on the quality that they think uh, that uh, the person may not sell them things that are not uh, fresh and things that are not safe. So even when interpersonal relationships of consumers and sellers uh, are, are seen in informal markets, they can provide a base for food safety. And there is also need to look further into the knowledge, attitudes, and perceptions to just ascertain 
what are their perceptions about food safety? Because sometimes we talk about food safety, but from whose perspective are we bringing this from? Is it the vendor's perspective? Is it the consumer's? Is it the producer's? So there's need to get to understand the perceptions of food safety from all these different actors. So that even when we're implementing uh, quality measures in place, already uh, consumers, vendors, and different actors' are, uh, perceptions have been taken into consideration uh, when developing these aspects. Uh, I'll bring in an aspect about uh, communities over the years, even within the traditional setups, had ways of testing for food safety. For example, we had a um, uh, we did a study in one part of Kenya in a pastoral community, and we were looking at aspects of uh, uh, disease, uh, zoonotic diseases in animals. And one of the things the community told us is they had traditional ways that they would use to test whether the food was safe for eating or not safe for eating. And they'd use these methods to try and test when an animal died of an unknown disease, they would use that method to test if the meat was good for consumption. And based on whether uh, they had indicators of knowing how, whether the, the meat would be good for consumption, using some ants, if the ants ate the meat, they'd know that meat was good. If the ants moved away from the meat, they would say that meat was not good and that meat would be um, rejected and not edible. So we find that uh, even in aspects of um, their cassava, different cassava varieties and some are toxic, some are not toxic. But communities over time have learned how to work within uh, with these kind of products. For example, cassava, the variety that's, that is toxic, communities don't boil it and eat it. They grind it, they dry it, they dry it for some time and grind it and mill it into flour. In that sense, uh, the poisonous aspect is neutralized and that then becomes safe for consumption. So one of the things we need to take into consideration is also the indigenous technical knowledge that exists in some of these communities, because that if information, if it's passed on, can be one of the aspects in which we can try and um, ensure food safety as uh, people move along. There's also the aspect of uh, what, what determines food safety. Is it how it looks? Is it the, the, the freshness? because many times people use their senses to determine whether food is fresh or whether food is safe. So there's that aspect of finding out what are the different um, indicators that even communities or consumers look for when they would determine that this food is safe or this is not safe. Um, so for us to improve uh, food safety, there's need to take into consideration both the uh, perceptions of the consumers, the perceptions of the different actors within the, the, the chain, all the way from the producers to the consumers, and also to look at the, um, their knowledge about food safety, to look at their attitudes towards food safety practices and food safety um, measures, to come up with a wholesome uh, and integrated kind of uh, uh, strategies that include both the, that takes into consideration the actors thoughts and the actor's perceptions for even the food safety measures to be acceptable and picked up. Um, I think I will stop. I will stop there uh, and thank you. So I hand it back to Elizabeth. Uh, Mr. Sifat, you can take the microphone. Thank you. Thank you, Elizabeth. Uh, a very good discussion. Uh, two of the points that I picked up right away that uh, that one slide of the presentation that it is a combination of a demand side and a supply side problem that not only uh, uh, like the private sectors from what we try to say that it is totally on the demand side that because consumers to, are not willing to uh, in the third world countries or consumers are not willing to pay higher for the value that's being added, these uh, specific aspects of, you know, uh, additional activities that will lead to the food safety that's not uh, going to happen. Uh, and also the second point uh, uh, th that was mentioned uh, by my previous speaker, uh, speaker, that what exactly constitutes food safety? From my experiences uh, working in the private sector in Bangladesh, uh, majority of the market in, in 
including the in individual customers or the institutional customers, they tend to look into the looks of it first, then to really go into exactly what are the aspects that defines food safety that goes beyond the look. I will uh, specifically go a little bit deeper into uh, my company's experiences working in the vegetable sector uh, in Bangladesh. Uh, as we call ourselves a 360 degree food solution provider, we go into import production and everything. So when we were doing uh, farming uh, by ourselves, uh, we were focusing into the very niche upmarket customers who were willing to pay higher. So we were following all the HSCCB guidelines in terms of production, harvest, post-harvest and everything. And the produce that we're producing was taken up easily by the end market consumers. Uh, by paying a little bit higher than the market, that worked perfectly. But when we started to scale that out to the mid-market or well, a little bit of upper mid-market, that model didn't work out because um, the value that we were adding was not being taken up by the end consumers. They did not want to pay that much of a price for the products that we were, uh, uh, we were saying that uh, that much of monetary value was added. Two reasons of that is like uh, the trust from the consumer's perspective is not there. So whenever how much uh, a company or a wet market producers try to say that it is a product that has been followed uh, from aspects of food safety and everything, all the procedures has been maintained. First of all, consumers don't want to believe it. That's why they don't want to uh, pay for it. Uh, the reason is there is no traceability option for the consumers to actually uh, just, uh, you know, uh, in rectify that it is actually all the steps that the seller is saying that it's been maintained is being happening or there is uh, any uh, it's a very generic brand so at catering to that two aspect uh, what we are trying to do right now is that trying to introduce branded perishables as in like starting off with fruits and vegetable products and using technology uh, blockchain technology we're trying to introduce uh, a system where consumers, when they buy the individual products, they can get to know the traceability of the products itself. And when I talk about traceability, I start from when the seeds were sown, how much of uh, pesticides uh, and uh, uh, chemicals were used during the harvest, what kind of harvesting procedures were added, what were the shelf life increasing procedures that were taken place in the post-harvest value chain, everything uh, as a part of the traceability document using blockchain technology, what we are planning to introduce is like uh, branded um, in the products uh, with a QR code based system where consumers can actually go uh, and QR code scan the product. And all this information of traceability will automatically come to the consumer's uh, mobile phone. They will get to know that what products they're going to buy and everything show, showing that. This is how we are planning to introduce a new product in the market just to test the mid-market consumers, whether they accept the product in terms of their uh, concerns regarding traceability, whether they will pay higher for the product or not. So uh, in the early next year, we will be launching this product, uh, product line uh, within the Dhaka city, which is our capital in Bangladesh, uh, targeting the mid-market consumers. And if that's successful, we will scale it up uh, nationwide going a little bit more into the mass market. Um, I can tell a little bit more about it um, in the next, if I have some time right now, other than that, I can stop it here. Yeah. Um, Okay, um, thank you very much. Hello, everybody, and thanks for the opportunity to speak with you today. I'm going to focus my comments on the incentives for food business operators serving mass markets to invest in food safety and how these incentives can be strengthened. Now, when we talk about incentives, we often immediately jump to consumer demand and from there to food businesses marketing their products as safer. I'm gonna argue that consumer demand on its own is not generally sufficient to generate the kind of response by firms that we are looking for, at least in the mass market in low and middle income countries. Rather, I see regulators as having a critical role to play in turning consumer demand for safe food into incentives for businesses to improve their practices. Regulators can do this by giving consumers information on which foods or which vendors are relatively safer and which are less safe. Providing this type of information is critically important because consumer demand for safe food is asymmetric. Telling someone that food is safe has far less impact on their behavior than telling them that it's not safe. 
And we see this in consumer behavior during food safety scares, when they massively overreact to stories in the media about formaldehyde on mangoes or aflatoxins in milk or COVID and chickens apparently, uh, versus their response to a marketing campaign for safety labeled food, which if pre-research showed was tepid to start with and then faded completely once the active marketing stopped and just a poster was left up marketing the brand. We also see this phenomenon in the quiet self-regulation by some food businesses. For example, many of the larger maize millers in Kenya use third-party verification of their food safety practices to make sure that they meet government standards. None of these millers use food safety claims to market their product, but by making sure that they're compliant with regulations, they avoid government recalls and bad press that could destroy their brands. So how can we harness this strong consumer response to negative information to improve food safety in informal markets? Well, one approach would be to start with a type of training and certification program that Delia mentioned Ilari tested for milk vendors in India and Kenya. So in such an approach, all willing vendors could be trained and then their practices would be monitored by the local food safety authority. Vendors observed to practice good food hygiene would be certified. And when there are enough certified vendors to meet demand, consumer attention could be called to the risks of buying food from uncertified vendors. Now, this is basically an incremental and voluntary approach to formalizing the food sector on the single dimension of food safety, which is arguably the most important one. But while it's voluntary, it also has teeth through the negative effect on uncertified vendors' businesses. Now, it's critical that the bar for this type of certification would not be set too high. It has to be feasible for vendors, and it also has to be affordable, which probably means compliance is a process rather than outcome-based, and there's no fee for certification. Asking butchers operating out of shacks and roadside vegetable vendors to finance improvements in public health is neither equitable nor realistic. Critical infrastructure and equipment, such as access to clean water and hand-washing stations, maybe even stainless steel bowls and um, water treatment solution, may also need to be provided. I want to also briefly address the issue of balancing trade-offs. Um, the available evidence suggests that the return on investment to improving food safety in low-income countries is very high, but costs tend to go up and benefits tend to go down the closer you get to the target of zero hazards. Making animal source foods and fresh produce perfectly safe and also completely unaffordable would of course be counterproductive to the ultimate goal of improving population health. So the key in the type of certification scheme that I've proposed and food safety in low income settings more generally is not to let perfection be the enemy of incremental improvement. And with that, I'll hand the mic back to Elisabetta. Thank you to our three panelists for your insightful remark. Uh, we now move to the Q&A, uh, starting with um, initial questions um, from the chat box as we continue receiving um, your questions through the Q&A box. Uh, Dr. Bukachi, a question for you. When we look at people that buy food in traditional markets, so so-called consumers, um, what food preference and perceptions are important to consider when working to improve food safety? Um, this has been mentioned, but can you give us some concrete examples um, of do consumers demand food safety from vendors and what does that look like in practice? Um, for example, are there gender differences? Thank you. Dr. Bocaccio, you may need to unmute. Yeah, yeah, yeah sorry. Uh, one of the things that we need, uh, we need to look at is uh, what drives people to buy food from specific places? Because you'll find that uh, even uh, there, there's been a lot of scares, food scares, and that has sometimes had an impact on how people behave in relation to purchase of things from the markets. So you'll find that sometimes people want to buy things from a place where what they see, how they look at it and how they see it, especially in the informal, informal uh, markets, they look for sometimes a place which looks clean, but that may sometimes drive them to buy things from where, uh, from the informal markets. But we also find differences in what people buy. 
you find more women buy the vegetable and green products, while men, you find them more buying the meats and the animal source foods. Apart from milk, which is more of a key thing that uh, it's the women who you find interacting more when it comes to buying the milk products. So there are a bit of those differences when it comes to what are people buying between men and women. So there are gender variations in who buys the animal source foods and what are the women buying. So uh, the food groups are, are a factor when it comes to what uh, you find men and women buying. Of course, cost. Cost is also another issue. You'll find uh, women may buy more of the vegetables because of the cost, mm -hmm. while men may buy the animal source foods because they're able to afford it. But when you go to the informal settlements, you find that uh, what people buy is not what they would buy in a more formal uh, market. For example, you find the small, as when a chicken is slaughtered, you find that there are some small pieces of, of chicken that may be put aside when a chicken is being prepared for maybe the supermarkets. So those inside parts of the chicken will find their way in the lower informal uh, settlement markets. And you'll find people buying food at a very low cost. Somebody is able to eat a piece of chicken, but not the main chicken, but the small cuts of chicken. So economy, the economic status is one of the drivers that drives people towards what they're buying. But aspects of trust is also quite key in terms of you go to buy things from a supermarket, of, uh, from an informal market, because you have a relationship and you can get something on credit. So that will drive you to buy things from a particular vendor. Because when you don't have money, they can give you that uh, product and you pay on credit. Thank you. I'd like to move to a question for Mr. Sifat. And in, from your perspective as a food business, um, how does your business and, and food production business in general in Bangladesh interact with traditional markets? Are there incentives or barriers to work with traditional markets? And does food safety impact what retail channels do you use? Yeah, um, from the, uh, thank you for the question. Uh, the traditional channel, which is the wet market that uh, in terms of, uh, you know, the total transactional volume that would cover 90%, 90 to 95% of the transactional volume. Uh, problem, uh, like I mentioned, getting into the market, uh, interacting with the consumers for a specific com uh, corporate companies like us, and there is no entry barriers, but the point is that, uh, you know, make the business, uh, you know, profitable it becomes very difficult when you, you are value adding at that back end, but consumers are not willing to pay higher because uh, like, uh, you know, there is no trust factor that there is, that the values are being added. Uh, there has been like, uh, um, Vivian was talking about marketing campaigns and everything. See in similar, uh, there has been similar incidences in Bangladesh, whether there were marketing campaigns, uh, people were discussing about it, but end of the day, uh, the mass market went back to the prime, very primary factor of, uh, you know, uh, the prices of the products. So, and also, uh, you know, the, the confidence on private sector only based on marketing campaigns, if there is no regulators involved only from the private sector, that doesn't uh, also work. It has to be a joint effort some uh, a regulator, a regulatory body imposing uh, impose, uh, some of the uh, you know, laws are being uh, enacted, imposed, and also a push from the private sector to prove their value added activities to the end, uh, mass market, how much it is possible. The combination of it will actually make sense. So yeah, but that's actually, uh, these are the two factors that's boiled down to at the end of the day. Thank you. Um, I'd like to turn to Dilia again uh, with a, a combo of two questions. Um, one, if um, can you elaborate a little bit on why, in, in some cases, uh, the formal supply chain can be riskier uh, than the informal? And can a HACCP system uh, be implemented by small or medium businesses in developing countries? Uh, and other panelists, feel free to um, chime in after Dilia. Thank you. Yeah, so I should say it varies. In some cases, the formal sector is safer. In some cases, they're both the same. And in some cases, they're less safe. In Vietnam, as I showed, the formal sector was less safe. And the reasons were, we think, threefold. 
Uh, firstly, um, there is little effective governance. So for example, you know, if food is inspected, inspectors can be bought off. The regulators are not really sincere. Um, the co consumers are not able to identify that they got sick from eating that pork and sue the, sue the supermarket, which like they can in, in high income countries. Um, also, there are problems with electricity. So electricity often you know, goes off for hours. That, that means the food in cold cabinets, the temperature rises and the bacteria grow very rapidly. And th thirdly, food tends to stay in those cold cabinets for you know, several days because supermarkets are only a small part of the supply, 3% of the supply in Bangladesh. Whereas in the wet markets, uh, the pig is killed at three o'clock in the morning and it's eaten by 12 o'clock at noon. So that doesn't give much time for bacteria to, to grow. Um, HACCP, I think, I've never seen it work uh, in SMEs in, in, in developing countries, but what is more promising is modified HACCP, which is taking the principles of HACCP. I've seen lots of people pretend what I call pseudo HACCP. So they have the kind of the, the big posters up and they have all the kind of, uh, like it's a pretend HACCP, but it's not, they're not really following the principles. Um, so I think a modified, simplified HACCP has more promise for developing countries. Thank you. Any other panelists want to chime in on this one? If not, I'll move on to a question from the audience, or several of these were a combination from the audience, but this one is from Lourdes Martinez. Romero asked for um, Vivian Hoffman. Uh, regulators tell me which companies are better could result in not so good political practices. Uh, trust is very important and many governments don't enjoy a good reputation. Can you also explain the intersection between voluntary and public standards? And again, any other panelists is welcome to chime in after um, Dr. Hoffman. Yeah. So in my remarks, I, I was really thinking about how how the regulator could influence consumer demand within the informal sector. Um, when we talk about the formal sector, all of that food has already supposedly, not always in practice, but the government has implicitly vetted that food and told consumers that it's safe. And so the regulators that I've spoken with, there's no way they're ever going to rank the food that's on the shelf in formal markets as safer versus less safe. Um, but implicitly, they're also currently saying that all the informal food is not safe because it hasn't been approved by, by the regulator at all. It hasn't, it's, it's informal. So it's outside of that system. So what I was thinking is that we could, you know, if the, if the authorities would be willing to start upgrading these informal markets, then they could begin promoting the, the subsector of the informal vendors that have already been upgraded and say these ones are safer than the ones that have not engaged in this training and certification program. So I totally agree with you. It, it would be crazy for the government to say, well, this is the best company and patronize this one rather than that one. It was really much more about, about informal markets. So sorry for the confusion there. Thank you. One last quick question, if you can, and then we need to wrap it up. But going back to um, Dr. Bocacci, uh, can you give us an example on, on a gender sensitive uh, enabling environment? Uh, we, we have touched upon some gender factors, but what do you think are um, interventions or uh, measures that can um, leverage gender? Thank you. Thank you for the question. I think when we look at gender issues, uh, we need to look at it also from both the consumer and the vendor perspective. Uh, looking at the different consumers, you'll find that uh, the gender issues arise in what are they buying and what are they thinking about what they buy. So there's need to look at the gender issues in relation to women, when they are uh, women and men in relation to their power of purchase. Because women many times have to depend on the men in terms of providing the money to enable them to be able to buy things from the market. If their purchasing power is low and they don't have the access to the finances, they may end up buying things which are cheaper and the quality may not be of high quality and the safety may also not be assured because of that lack of uh, uh, sufficient money to buy. So when we are looking at also aspects of regulation of safety, which may increase the price of the products in the market, these need to also take into consideration 
uh, the consumers and uh, their purchasing power of the different consumers. Uh, when we look at the vendors also, we find that um, different vendors, uh, th there's kind of a gendered perspective when it comes to what is marketed. You find women a lot in the, in the vegetables, uh, selling more of the vegetables. When it comes to sale of the animal source foods, a lot of it is male vendors. So uh, in terms of targeting in information, there is need to target information based on who is selling what. Where do we find more gender, uh, more men selling and more, more women selling? So that information is targeted to the different uh, gender groups. Thank you. Thanks so much. And alas, we are approaching the end of the hour. And while the discussion continues in the Q&A box, so please uh, check that. I'd like to pass the microphone back to Delia for her concluding remarks. Delia. Thank you very much, everyone, all the panelists and the participants. This has been a really uh, interesting, uh, interesting discussion. Um, one of the question and answers, I think, from Ahmed was, how about food safety and One Health? And I think this was a, a truly One Health event. Here we've had the private sector, who is often left out of these, these discussions. We have anthropologists, economists, and myself, an uh, epidemiologist. So food safety, I, I think, is a one health, and, and, and it requires the sectors to come together. It requires agriculture, uh, political science, economists, and environmentalists, if we want to, to, to solve these, these problems. Um, I think it was very interesting to turn the spotlight on the informal sector. We all know that, um, that this is where nearly, in the poorest countries, this is where nearly all of the food is sold especially the riskiest food, the fresh produce and the animal source food, and yet it has been the most neglected and ignored of the food safety areas. In the past, investments have tended to focus on exports uh, or the formal sector. These are good. There's nothing wrong on focusing on exports uh, on the formal sector. They are essential parts of the economy, but we mustn't forget the, the, the informal markets where the poor buy and the poor sell and where recent studies have shown 98% of the health burden falls and costs over $100 billion a year in terms of lost human development. So I think we're coming to terms with the extent of the problem. Now we need to get to grips with the solutions. And we've heard many promising ideas. Um, we have some very interesting projects underway I see some of the participants and the leaders of these projects in the Q&A, and I'm hoping that uh, in another five years, we can come back to a seminar like this, and I will be able to say, and now we have solutions that work in the mass markets of low and middle income countries. Thank you all again for attending. It's been a pleasure. Wonderful, thanks, Adelia. And to conclude, I'd like to remind you that the recording of this this webinar will be available on the GAIN events page. And the next webinar in the Eat Safe series will be on September 3rd, same time, on the topic of measuring performance for food safety and delving into what food indicators, food safety indicators have been useful and which ones should we use to assess progress at different scales. So we appreciate you joining us today and look forward to seeing you throughout the series. Stay safe and eat safe. Goodbye. <laughs>